much to everybody for joining the webinar this afternoon. It's Friday, thank goodness, nearly the weekend. Um, I have been doing quite a few webinars and we did one on what is facilities management and I thought it might be useful to do one as well on what is office management. I know a number of you are probably already office managers um, and a lot of this you probably already know and are already doing. Um, however, if some of you are PAs and looking to move into an office management career, this might be helpful. And we're also going to look at some of the ways in which you can excel in this role. So a little bit of um, background, first of all, in terms of what office management is. So according to um, Wikipedia, office management is a profession involving the design, implementation, evaluation and maintenance of the process of work within an office or other organisation in order to sustain and improve efficiency and productivity. And I've highlighted some words in bold there. Um, I think those are the really key bits um, to take from this. I looked up quite a few different ways that uh, different companies and online resources have described office management and this to me was one of the best ways that summed it up. It's a massive job with so much responsibility um, and yeah I think this was one of the better ways to describe it. They've also said that is it's part of therefore the overall administration of the business and since the elements of management and forecasting um, and planning, organising, command, control and coordination, the office is part of a total management function, which I completely agree in. And I think that's why, you know, in terms of titles, office managers quite fitting. I think it's um, general enough to cover the breadth of responsibilities that you have by having that manager in the title. It does recognise that it's a senior role, perhaps, um, and that you do have a management function in there, whether you manage people directly or not. So I, I felt like that summed it up quite nicely. Um, I sum it up quite regularly as office managers are responsible for ensuring a safe, healthy and effective working environment with the minimum disruption for staff, clients and contractors. So a little bit shorter and easier to, to probably grasp, but really that, that to me says everything about the role and it keeps it at such a high level that anything that you are given in your role probably still fits quite nicely within that um, way of summing it up. So we'll have a look at um, a few areas here. Now, one of the ones that I thought was quite interesting, and please do let me know on the chat um, how perhaps you fell into the office management role. Um, but most people will have been a PA or an EA or some sort of assistant or secretary, um, perhaps a receptionist, or they were maybe an office junior or office administrator, or maybe involved in a project that then led them to have the office management position. Um, I certainly went down the PA EA route and then I was PA EA um, to the office management team at JP Morgan, which is how I was then given the opportunity to be office manager and promoted. So, yeah, I think that's how a lot of us tend to fall into these roles. So do chat me and let me know if you were any of these before you were an office manager or if you perhaps went straight into office management or if you were something completely different and that led you into the position. I'd be really interested to hear how you got to the office management role. So what's the difference to facilities management? We covered the reverse of this in the facilities management webinar where we looked at what the difference to facilities management is to office management. Um, so office management has a wider range to me of responsibilities compared to a facilities management position. The office manager will probably have facilities management in their role, which is generally looking after the hard services um, like air conditioning, for example. So the things and assets that are built within um, built with, into a building um, to keep it running and life safety systems and things. And also some of the soft services like looking after the cleaning, the security, the waste management and all those things. They're often considered facilities management related. But in addition, you'll look after things like catering, supplies, print, meeting room management, reception, telecoms, IT, coach room and mail management, HR, accounts, invoicing, procurement, health and safety, marketing, culture and more. Sound familiar? Um, and they're two very blended roles, um, but mean, you know, one of them will work in most places and they'll mean the same thing. 
So often I have been operations manager, facilities manager and office manager. Um, but actually my role has generally always been the same. So to me, this is office management. This is where you work for a company rather than a building and you manage the facilities side of things as well as all these other parts of your, um, your position. Now, this is a survey um, snippet from one that we did before we created the office management portal. I think most of you are members of that, but for anyone that doesn't know, it's an online resource um, hub that we created a few years ago. And um, we did a survey before we, we built it to just over 100 office managers around the UK. And these were the results of the different responsibilities. It was a tick box and they could add other in there as well of different responsibilities that they have in your in their role. So you can see how varied it is just from these results. And we knew it already, right? But you know, you can see invoicing and finance is actually a massive part of a lot of people's roles. And I think that's where the majority of the respondents that we, we went to and we spoke to were working for smaller and medium sized companies. Um, for the SMEs. But um, yeah, some of the larger ones, obviously, they wouldn't have invoicing and finance sitting with them because they would be part of, of a completely separate team. It might just be that they need to approve invoices rather than actually process and pay them. So yeah, very, very interesting. You know, office engineering, maintenance and servicing is sat right down at the bottom end of 12%. But I think there's a big degree in the middle here that a lot of you can relate to. So um, yeah, very, very varied role indeed. So what are your areas of responsibility? Um, do they vary much from that? Was there anything on there that you thought that's not an area that I've ever looked after? Again, let me know in the chat if you want to. It'd be good to, to see what you're responsible for in your roles as well and if there's anything completely different. So where did they say they spent their time? And I think, again, this aligns to where a lot of people spent their time. So you can see the darker purple is almost always part of their role and um, the lighter purple is very often part of their role. So again, finance and invoicing is quite high up there. Um, office refurbishment and fit out down at the other end here is often part of their role. Um, so again, if you're working in a perhaps bigger organisation where you're doing lots of change and moves and things, um, then that might be a part of your role quite regularly. Whereas if you're in a smaller organisation, you probably will do that only ever if you move offices. You probably won't have a, ref, a fit out or refurbishment to do um, within your, your small office. So, yeah, again, you can see it really varies. And that also shows how much demand is on these roles and time. So, again, keen, no one's chatting to me at the moment, but really keen to let um, to hear your thoughts on where you spend most of your time as well. So do let me know in the chat if, um, if it varies or if you agree with with those results. So why do we call it, or why do I call it, jack of all and master of some? Well, you have to be a jack in these roles at so many things. And I don't mean jack in the sense that you're no good at it and you are, you know, this sort of jack of all trades, master of none type character. I mean that you kind of have to know a little bit and scratch the surface with some of the areas that you're responsible for you can't be the expert you can't master in every single one you know again if we go back to these areas of responsibility you can't be an expert or maybe you can but it would be quite miraculous if you were an expert in every single one of these areas and you knew everything in detail about all of these areas because one it's time two it's training availability three you don't really need to be an expert you just need to know enough to not even just get by maybe perhaps just beyond getting by but being able to have the conversations with your suppliers and your service providers to say you know to challenge things like quotes and um why why does that need fixing tell me what's wrong with it and then be able to channel that back up to your seniors and say this is what's wrong this is why we need to spend two thousand pounds on it I've checked it, it I agree I approve it can you approve it as well and things like that so you need to master in some um, but not all and it might be that you decide to master in the ones that you find more interesting so as geeky as it is I really found health and safety interesting and particularly doing desk assessment so I decided to take that further and find out a lot more about it I also found business continuity um, planning and processing and preparing policies interesting so I decided to take that one further as well um, so yeah you might you might 
and be lucky enough to have the option of saying, do you know what, these are the areas that I want to excel in and, and master um, and become that expert in. But generally, we're jack of all and master of some. So lean on the experts. There's so many around you in these roles. Um, you know, be your um, service provider. Sorry, I've got hay fever. It's terrible today. They're, they're your service providers. So, you know, your air conditioning engineers, your stationary provider, your cleaning company, um, you know, your fit out contractor, your move um, heavy lifting men. All these different people are experts. They are the ones that just do that particular job and they know it in depth. So lean on them. Ask 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 again for support for advice challenge things why how what tell me um, and focus where the role permits on two or three areas as I say to expert on and um, you find of interest and make a case for training i think it's really important when we're doing a um, panel discussion on this again in a couple of weeks about um, the lack of training and support in these roles and approval for training for office and administrative roles. And I think, you know, there's so many ways that you can prove why training is invaluable to you. It's um, that return on investment. If they enable you to grow and develop, they see that return on investment for the business and how much more you can expert and master in these positions and um, probably save an awful lot of money down the line as well because your ability to challenge your ability to upskill your ability to manage and mentor your team properly and effectively so that they can take on more and therefore you can take on more all of these things will eventually have a saving there so okay so key skills needed um, you may again um, have, there's so many skills, right? I think you need to do office management, but these to me have always been the top ones. And again, you may have um, some different ones that you want to put in there. It'd be lovely to have someone put something in the chat if you're happy to. Um, but I, I think being highly organized is, is one that comes up so much. You know, if you think about going for a, an office management role in a job interview, one of the things I think they'll be looking for is, the fact that you say you're you're extremely organized and that you prove that somehow um so my advice you know in an interview situation would be to to go prepared with some paperwork in front of you that documents you know what you've done in the past perhaps some evidence of that have your cv in front of you the job spec in a nice presented folder to show that you are highly organized you're really prepared um, i think under that umbrella of highly organized come these sort of sub skills if you like multitasking prioritizing and timing really really important to be able to multitask because you will literally be sat there one moment dealing with I don't know, inputting into a database for getting your access card system updated and all your staff, um, you know, this new access and sorting all of that out. And then someone will come and say, the toilet's blocked. And you have to shift your mindset to that, ring the cleaners, go and check it out, put an out of order sign on the toilet, lock the door, and then come back to your database and what you're doing. And another minute later, you might get a call saying, the air conditioning unit's leaking above Joe's desk, okay? back to it in a second you know you really need to be able to multitask and be able to move away from things and come back to them with ease prioritizing obviously very key um, the ability to see what um you know you've got to do is one is one thing that's a challenge in itself to be able to have that kind of overarching view of right all these are the tasks that i've got to do and they're not just tasks that are put in front of you because Joe's phone about the air conditioning leak or to message you about the toilet um, being blocked but all the other things that people perhaps can't see that need to be done and you can um, so making sure that you prioritize those along with everything else that you have to do and timing timing is so key in these roles being proactive staying one two ideally three steps ahead of the game so you know if you know that there's a big meeting coming up that's really important or an event in the office making sure that it's tip-top condition you know it's clean that all the air conditioning units have been serviced and um, so that you're not going to have any issues with that um, you know anything and everything make sure the plants and the flowers are in tip-top condition all these kind of things knowing what's going on in your business and being able to use that to stay ahead and ensuring that that environment that we talked about at the beginning that you are in charge of that you're responsible for maintaining and ensuring it's smooth and without disruption to to the business and your staff in any way um, being proactive is a big part of that and the success of that and um, being self-motivated so i touched on this a second ago 
when we talk about the highly organized skill but being able to see everything as i say and um see things that aren't perhaps that obvious to other people and being self-motivated to be able to go and, and do them and see them and say right okay well this needs to be fixed or this is something i'm going to sort out and i'll give you an example so my last permanent job before i set the business up um was at an investment bank a private investment bank german run one and they um had oh i don't know something like 13 mfd the multifunction device printers the big floor standing ones and they weren't ever really working we had so many calls and complaints on them particularly in our big research department and the research guys were printing really finite graphs and you know graphics that had all this intricate detail in that wasn't really coming out very well on print and sometimes they were shrinking it from what was an a4 size to an a5 size to just be able to give the clients a smaller booklet but when they went and tendered these printers long before i started at the company no one ever tested with the printers um, or you know the various various options out there whether these graphs would work what they would look like and how they would print so we always had issues they always smudged or they just they just weren't sharp enough to actually read and bearing in mind this was the research department and this is them selling you know their services of research which people would buy and pay for they couldn't demonstrate how valuable they were by, by having these graphs and being able to show that so it was a really key part but you know we were spending two or three hundred thousand pounds if not more on these devices and the printing um, of of them each year and yet we weren't really able to use them properly so i started to look at it and did this massive project brought different companies in to have a look at how much we were spending on printing and what other devices were out there versus also having our own reaper graphics room and building that somewhere we had this massive ridiculous first aid room that we didn't really ever use or need um, and yeah I looked at you know having the cost of two or three reaper graphics people run that place from you know six seven a.m when we really needed someone in till sort of ten eleven o'clock at night when people are still printing things um, you know holiday pay all those things I did this huge project and demonstrated that we could save about a hundred odd thousand pounds a year so that self-motivation you know that that eye to be able to identify something that isn't quite right um, you can't necessarily fix it and you actually have that um yeah that self-motivation that passion to be able to go oh do you know what i'm going to have a look into this further it's almost like being a little bit of a pi and investigating a bit further and digging deeper and deeper and deeper but doing it having that ability or that desire to do and to, to make something better or achieve something um you know that's better for the business so being self-motivated the communication it really 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 is key people get pretty upset if you don't tell them what's going on when things are happening when you're allowed to because obviously sometimes there will be sensitivities things will be confidential like an office move for example and um, when they're first talking about moving offices it might be sensitive because you might be downsizing and therefore there might be redundancies coming or it might just be you know that it's not public knowledge yet again um, when JP Morgan were looking to move to Canary Wharf, I was in the team that was one of the sort of first 100 people that knew about it globally around the world. Um, and 100 people is quite a lot, but when you think about the amount of employees they had, I think it's over 30,000 or something, maybe more that they employed, actually it was a really small number. And we had to keep it to ourselves and work on it overnight, out of hours, in the office late, so that no one else knew what was going on until we knew that we could fit in the building that, that they eventually moved into. So when the time is right, communicate and make sure that you stay in touch. Let people know if you can't get to something then, when they will be able to um, you know, see, see you getting to it. Um, set that expectation and let them know. You know, again, let's take air conditioning as an example because it's a real um, political point. If you tell someone that you know they report it to you and you say, yeah, I'm on it, it will be better in about an hour. Let me know if you don't feel the change. That's much better than saying, it's fixed or um you know i'm on it or something like that i'm on it, it's fine first of all but then perhaps updating again to say it's fixed you should feel the difference in about an hour but let me know if not you're then giving them all the information putting the ball back in their court to say come back to me if it's not quite right and you're kind of um, building that bridge there to, to enable them to do that so it really really is key and there's so many wonderful ways that you can do that 
Okay, so my advice on how to excel in these roles, we've talked about staying three steps ahead at all times. It really, really is important. And I think, you know, some other examples other than the one I gave about events are probably around, um, you know, with your team and with reception and doing housekeeping checks. So um, in the portal, for example, there's a housekeeping checklist and there's a few different formats. There's some apps on the phones that you can get as well. And you can set up a list to literally walk around your office every morning or maybe once or twice a week if it's a bit smaller and, and doing it every day doesn't really make sense. But getting to know it and getting around there before anybody highlights issues to you. Because it's so negative. Our roles can be so negative at times and challenging and uh, yeah, somewhat deflating when it's just bad news, you know, can you fix this? This has gone wrong coming at us all the time. And we will always have days like that with firefighters at the end of the day. Um, but if you're able to get to the problem before anybody else does and report it and then shoot around that email back to the communication point to say, we're aware of this problem, we've already reported it and this is the ETA for it to get fixed or we're waiting on an update, whatever it might be, you have stayed three steps ahead and you are the master at communicating. There's so many different ways that you can do that. Um, I would recommend if you don't already have it in Excel or Google Sheets, whatever your preference, have a rolling project list of things to do. And I don't mean projects as in it's, you know, big projects like the Reaper Graphics room as an example. I mean as in things like, you know, waste bins, sort out the waste bins signage and put new signage up. Just all these small things that you want to get sorted at some point in time that you notice perhaps when you're doing your housekeeping check or if you've just moved offices or if you're new at the role, just write everything down and have that wonderful list there. Keep it in priority order. It will help you to manage your list. It will help you to manage your tasks. It will help you to delegate if you've got a team as well, because you can go through it every so often and say, actually, now so-and-so could probably take that on because I've upskilled them and they're able to do this particular task. So keep that list there. And the other thing it's really good for is to look back on when you have um, appraisals or um, you know year-end reviews, whatever it might be. I, I really think it's important um, to have that in place and, and, and keep you organised because there's so, so many things that we have to do on an ongoing basis. Um, let people know you need to know. So another example of this is a move. When you don't know that something like an office move, even if it's just an internal one is coming, it really, really impacts you and your role and how you'll feel about that company and your manager and all the other people in it because no one's talking to you and you feel like you're just kind of the bottom of the chain and the last to know so set that precedent early on um in your role to say do you know what when things like this are happening be it a move be it change in the business be it um you know that you want to save lots of money whatever it might be if it impacts where well, you can influence it somehow in your role let them know that you need to know um, and make that clear constantly ask set up those one-to-ones and let people know you need to know Communicate, communicate and do it again. I think we've touched on this one enough, but um, that also comes down to a little bit about letting people know you need to know. So if you have a separate HR team, for example, in your business and you don't have a dotted line to report into them, I know some people do. Um, I, I've reported to HR in the past in these roles. Make sure you get a meeting in with maybe not the head of HR, but maybe one of the recruiters or um, you know one of the, the generalists in that team to catch up with them regularly because HR know an awful lot about what goes on in the business. They're much closer sometimes to senior management than we can get to. So if you set up that relationship with them and also ask the questions, you know, what's the pipeline look like for this year in terms of new hires, you'll be able to manage your capacity and your footprint and everything else much easier. Um, so yeah, trying to get those higher numbers from them of, yeah, we've got approval to hire five new roles in these different departments will keep you ahead of the game and enable you to communicate and build that bridge much easier. Sharing a management information pack. So when I mentioned about the project list and it being useful for things like your appraisals and your objectives at year end, it's also going to be useful for when you do this. 
And it may seem like a little bit of overkill, but if you struggle to get buy-in for things for you or for your business or to hire an office junior, for example, because you've got to over 50 staff and you realize now that, you know what, there are so, so many um, things to do. I need some help, even if it's part-time. It will always help you to start building that case by demonstrating what is going on in the business from your side of the fence. So in that pack could be things like an overview, a very simple summary of what's happened in the last quarter or the last six months or whatever interval you decide to base it on. Um, things like, for example, that you've done some first aid training, that you have implemented a new policy on health and safety, um, that you've changed and tendered the engineering company because you just weren't happy with the last one. All these kind of things that are just small but actually very impactful um, things that you do, tasks that you complete. And then, you know, if you have access to your budget, you can show savings or where your spend is year to date and where it, it's looking like um, going for the rest of the year. Is it on target or are you going over budget or under and so on and so forth? all sorts of things like that. And I also would say having in there joiners, leavers, um, any transfers, if you have people transferring from one department to the other, um, and then moves and changes as well. Again, the last company I worked in, we had 65,000 square feet and 300 of staff, and we had moves, joiners, leavers all the time. So my quarterly pack would look quite big. You know, I'd have sort of 42 joiners, 17 leavers, 20 moves you know all these kind of things and by moves i mean the individual you'd count the number of people that have moved rather than the occurrence of, of moves um yeah to show you know what we've done i even got my reception team to um i think it was emails or something or meeting rooms yeah meeting room bookings i got them to count how many meetings were held in in those quarters so you know it's like four and a half thousand a quarter or something like that and it would show the fluctuations of when we're busiest, when we're not. And it really started to paint a picture. So definitely doing a management information pack is, is a big one. That will enable you to do this next point, which is to shout about your successes. By doing that, um, again, you're demonstrating to people how valuable you are because you really are in these roles and why they need to invest in you, you know, why they need to provide you with training for things like if you want to go out and do your own desk assessments, we can demonstrate we've spent this much money on doing them with a consultant or online or whatever. But actually, if you just spend this much on me going out training for a day or two, I can do it and save this much money and we'll have a much better success rate with desk assessments and people feeling better at their desk and all these other things you can do. Doubt about your successes and your wins because no matter how small they might seem to you, they're big, as I say, they influence so many different things in that business you might not be aware of. So let people know. Learn from your failings. You are, you know, undoubtedly going to trip up and fall sometimes. And there's not always people there to catch you in these roles, unfortunately. It's it's a kind of learn as you go type position, particularly when you get, you know, new projects on like the pandemic as an, as an example um, no one's ever dealt with this before and I bet an awful lot of that responsibility and the buck for getting people set up and comfortable at home fell on your shoulders so you know where it went wrong note it down have your own kind of journal if it helps and um, learn from it because we, we can't be perfect to everything and there is so much to do and so much lying on your shoulders in these roles that yeah you're you're going to trip up and um, yeah, the best thing to do is is shrug yourself off and just keep going um, and, you know, don't look back, just learn from it and um, keep, keep improving. Prepare for everything possible, every meeting, every eventuality, every single thing. So every meeting I used to go into, and I still do, um, I would have notes on my notepad. I was very much a notepad type person. Um, I think I did have an iPad at one point and used the pen, but it just wasn't for me. I quite liked the the physical um, stationery there. But I would prepare, even if it was not a lot to say in the meeting and I was just going along, you know, just to be an ear there or whatever it might be, I would have notes to ask at least one or two questions or, you know, give an update, whatever it might be, being that voice, where it's sensible to, sometimes not so much. Um, but yeah, always going in prepared. If you have one-to-ones with your manager, make notes, share your successes, you know, ask away, you know, what's happening in the business, any plans this year to move, any plans next year to move, just ask these questions and keep asking them regularly, but go prepared. Um, if the questions don't get answered, roll them onto the next one to one and the notes for those. So um, prepare as much as possible. 
every eventuality, um, you know, we're all going to, I'm sure, learn from this COVID situation now. And this is a really great opportunity to start looking at your business continuity plan and get involved in that if, if you're allowed to and if that sits in your remit. And looking at these eventualities again and what you might do if something like this happens next time. Lean on your staff, upskill them and trust them. It is a difficult one to do if you're anything like me and you're a bit of a control freak, but it is so valuable. Be able to um, lean on people that you hire, particularly if you hire them and you're part of that process, and start trusting them to give them additional tasks and responsibilities. You know, receptionists and PAs, um, if, if they're not part of your role, because I appreciate some people it will be part of their office management role to be on reception, to be a PA and an office manager, an awful lot more hats to wear. But if it's not, or if you ever are given the opportunity to hire somebody that you manage, a junior person to you, then do lean on them, you know, go back to your project list, as I say, and see what you can start to give them. Sit with them, give them, give them your time and upskill them because what that will mean in the future is that you can look up to your manager then and say, look, I've got a bit of capacity now to take this responsibility on, which is something I've always been interested in doing. I feel like it's an area that I can improve for the business. I can make an impact. I can save some money. I can improve our process, whatever it might be. Is that okay if I take it on? And you can demonstrate how effective you are as a manager and a leader and a mentor as well. So really, really important one if you do manage staff or are ever given the opportunity to. OK, so talking about career progression, um, I've spoken to a lot of people over the years, um, particularly since I set the business up. I've got a lot of members that call me um, sometimes completely out of the blue. They just call my mobile number, which is absolutely fine. And I love hearing from everyone. So. Um, if you ever want to, feel free to. Um, but just saying, you know, I'm going for an interview or an office management role. Can you give me some advice, whatever it might be, and some tips? And um, then somehow, often we we get talking about an office management career and where the career progression is. And sometimes people just ring me for advice. And I think, and again, um, chat if you have any other opinions on this. But I think these are possible nice routes that people take and the ones that I often see people taking. HR um, is one that's very common. A lot of people are given HR as part of their office management responsibility and then they will go into um, a standalone HR role at some point. Um, it's never really been of interest to me to, to do HR um, in, in that much um, capacity so it's not a route I've ever taken but I know a lot of people do and, and really enjoy it so that's a nice one to know that if you want to progress from office management that's that's an area to go to. Um, global office manager so if you're a local office manager at the moment in London or wherever in the world or country you might be if you've got um, the remit within your business to take on additional offices and therefore manage perhaps some other staff or there's no office manager in these other offices and you might be able to take them on, that's a really nice remit to have or to leave you know, that business if you wanted to step up and there was no progression there available to you to look for one that is that kind of global head of office management. Head of administration, so um, particularly in law firms and things, you'll see that office and facilities managers are generally um, in, in charge of and responsible for PAs, assistants, EAs, um, all those administrative roles. Um, so that's a really nice one to either add and tack on to the office management or move into that completely independently and effectively you then manage, you know, 70, 80 assistants in a big firm. Really good. Uh, and COO and CFO, I was very much on track in my last employment to be COO um, for the business. I'd highlighted them that I think they needed one in Europe and my managing director said to me, right, well, let's mentor you over the next two, three years so you become that. Unfortunately, I decided to leave and set up my own business. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really wonderful track into a much more senior, you know, seat at the table type role if you've got the desire to move. And some people don't, some people are happy staying um, you know, in their role where they are and that suits them, that suits their business, their, their lifestyle at home, um, you know, if they've got children and other commitments and so on, it's absolutely fine. But people often ask me about career progression of an office manager and they don't feel like there are options open to them. I, I wholly disagree. I think there are. Um, so yeah, COO is a really good one. And if that's a track you think you're nearly ready for, say for example, you 
have done most of those things we saw on that responsibility chart, particularly things like the finance and the legal elements. And you've had a bit of a taste for those in your role um, and you've managed people before, you know, for some time. Maybe talk to your boss about mentoring and, and going for that. Um, and I'm happy to speak for anyone offline if they want to get some advice on how to do that. Okay, so the basics of the role. How are we doing for time? About halfway through. So the way I always look at office management, and it's a bit of a funny way, but I think it works, um, is three different sections. So the box to me is the outside of where you work, the office or the workplace. Um, it's the outline frame and in here are the things that you need to keep running safe and working, such as the fixtures and fitting of the life safety systems like your alarms and your emergency lighting and so on, and the landlord requirements. The people are those that you look after within that box. So um, your employees, the staff, uh, contractors, visitors, clients, and so on. Anyone that comes into the premises is immediately your responsibility in terms of a lot of these areas like health and safety, and um, you know, making sure that things are working, that they've got supplies and coffee and those kind of things in place for them. Um, so training is also part of that. And the suppliers and services, so those that provide you goods or services that support the running of your business, like stationery, teas, coffees, cleaning, shredding, etc. So all of those together um, combine your remit of the role and how it fits. So looking at the box in more detail, if you picture your home and everything you have to do to run it, um, so let's say, for example, paying your bills to keep the electrics on and the gas on to warm it up, um, you know, the council tax, paying your mortgage or your rent, getting furniture in, cleaning. You know, you start to build a picture when you think about how you run your home. You then transfer that to your office, your workplace, and it's pretty much the same. It's just probably a lot bigger, more expensive, and there's a lot more children to look after. Um, and anyone that um, has got lots of staff in their company will probably know what I mean by that. Particularly, I think some of our office management members are called the office mummy. Um, and I think that's why <laughs> and we see them as our children. There are clients technically. Typical items in your box will be emergency signage and equipment, like life safety systems and so on, lighting and emergency lighting, air conditioning and fresh air systems, doors, walls, ceilings and voids and flooring and raised access floors, electrics, data and other services. So all the kind of stuff that we sit in and we don't really necessarily see or appreciate all the time, but that's our framework. This is a typical setup of an office. So if you literally just carved one in half, this is kind of what it would look like. Well, no, probably not at the moment. Well, maybe there's just one person in there. There's no one else within two meters. So maybe it's a, a true reflection of the times at the moment. But you have a ceiling void where you often have a lot of the air conditioning systems. You'll have some data cables possibly going through there. Um, some of the emergency cables for things like your fire alarms, your sprinkler systems, all of those sorts of things will be running through that ceiling void. You then have a suspended ceiling often, unless you've got an exposed one, which is quite trendy these days, but you'll often have a void um, and then the suspended ceiling with, with your tiles or something, or it might be plasterboarded if you've got something a bit more fancy and feature lighting on it. Um, but yeah, you'll have that in place and everything above it that you can't see. You then have partition walls, which are walls that can be taken in and out. So they're, they're temporary walls essentially. Um, and they can come in different shapes and sizes and thicknesses and things for soundproofing. And then you have something called block walls, which are your um, structural walls. So things that can't be changed without getting a structural engineer in and getting lots of permission from your landlord and things because they're connected to the um, design and the architecture of the building. The structure. Um, and then you have a floor base. So, um, you know, it might be that you've got carpeted um, tiles on there or you might have exposed floor tiles, the sort of metal ones. You might have wood flooring, marble flooring, all sorts of things, but you'll have a floor base of some sort. And in most offices, the newer built ones, you'll have a raised access floor. So another floor void, okay, much like the ceiling, where a lot of cables, particularly again for data, for power, will run through. You'll probably have things like pest control traps and stuff in there as well. So they'll put your um, mouse traps and stuff. Um, and you'll be able to access things like that through your floor box either something that lifts out or you might just have a little hole, you have cleaner sockets in there as well, all sorts of things. Um, and then you've got a concrete slab. So again, that's the structure of the building. The slab um, is the base before we get to then the next floor down. Okay, 
So that's generally what an office will look like. Um, and then below the floor and above the ceiling, there's just some images here. So you can see, you know, you've got things like air conditioning pipes and extract vents and things there, lots of cabling and wires. This is a partition wall, so you can see how it's built if you've not seen one before, before the plaster and the paint is put on. And then this is a raised access floor, so the floor tiles and then the stilts, which they rest on basically. Um, and then the cabling and the electrics that run through. So this is electric cabling and data cabling here. Okay, the people, so staff, employees, managers, visitors, clients, contractors, anybody that uses your office space, whether they're just in there for a split second or not, they're all the people that we have to look after. Um, there's many rights that employees have in relation to the environment they work in. Um, under the Health and Safety at Work Act, um, there's more available online there, but you'll probably know that there's various things that we have to do as employers or representatives of our employers to make sure that they're safe and they're trained and they can be competent to do their job. Um, when working in an office as the office manager, we do tend to see um, that all staff are or visitors are our clients. But it's our job to make sure they're comfortable, safe and happy working in that environment. I've always considered them my clients, even when they're being a pain in the butt. I have a saying called, there's always a drop dead Fred. Did anyone ever used to see or ever watch that film, Drop Dead Fred? I think when you get over sort of 15, 20 staff in an office, there's generally one, two, three, four drop dead Freds in your office. but just a pain in the butt. Um, and you'd rather they weren't there. Um, but yeah, even those drop dead Fred guys or girls are um, our, our clients and we need to make sure that we're looking after them. If you're new in your role um, or even maybe, you know, late on, it might be good to try and get feedback from employees. Make a list or add it to that rolling things to do list, but don't ever make any promises. If you ever go to a new role as office manager, it's one of the first things I would try and do. Get a group of PAs together and just sit down with them with a lunch if you can and just, you know, get feedback. What do you think works here? What do you think doesn't work? Or every time you get to speak to someone in the kitchen, you know, it be it any employee whatsoever, you know, what do you think of the coffee here? What do you think of the kitchen? Do you think there's enough space? Just trigger some questions and just try and find out. And it's not necessarily that you can fix it. You just start to get a picture of where people's bugbears are. And then given the opportunity, if you do ever get the chance to do a, a shuffle or a move or a change um, or move offices all together and refit it, you'll start to have a picture of what works well in your office and what doesn't. And it also really shows that you care and you've got empathy and you are open to ideas about the role. I need to take him out. So, OK. Um, yeah, so early on in your role, try and get that feedback, make that list, put it on your rolling things to do list, even if you can never get to doing it and fixing things. Um, it's just really good to ask and it just shows people that you're connected and you care. With the introduction of the GDPR um, in May, a couple of years ago, it's crucial to understand your requirements here in relation to your people as well. So if you're not up to speed on that, make sure you know about the data protection rights. So as an example, things like accident report forms, you need to make sure that those sort of things where they're filled in are locked away and not accessible to anybody else. Um, so bearing in mind, because you are looking after people in your role, you'll have a responsibility there as well. Typical areas of people involvement, joiner and leaver onboarding. I think a lot of office managers are responsible for this. It, it doesn't often fall to HR beyond doing interviews and setting up their employment contracts and that side of the onboarding. Um, normally it falls the office manager to do things like make sure they've got a desk set up and their desk location has been assigned. They've got equipment, a mobile phone, um, a desk phone if you have them, stationary, well compact, desk assessment, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I, I really enjoy that part of, of the office management role. And I think that leads nicely into the induction training and tour. So if you don't, as an office manager, I really recommend meeting all your new joiners and giving them that tour around your building, um, showing them the flyer exits and so on and so forth, and then doing a, um, a training session with them. Whether you have people in regularly joiners, um, you know, in higher numbers, you might decide to do them weekly. If you don't have so many, you might decide to do them monthly. Um, but yeah, it covers a lot of health and safety legislation to, to do that induction training as well, like um, general health and safety, like slips, trips and falls, and information about the building, fire safety, desk assessments. Um, if you want to share information on your business continuity plan, it's another good thing to do. And a company overview, you know, who you are, what the company does, who you are as in um, your role and your team. So a really nice way to, to get to know everybody.
um, ongoing health and safety and wellness. So yeah, there's a huge piece of scope here in terms of health and safety, not just for your box and keeping your box um, maintained and safe, but also your people in terms of the training and making sure that the risks are removed altogether or reduced, um, putting competent people in place to look after health and safety, having you know your poster displayed, insurance certificate out there, first aiders, fire marshals, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, you'll have all your regular day-to-day -day requests um, on things like can you turn the air conditioning up or down or up and down at the same time because we can all do that. Um, and cleanliness, stock and supplies, meeting rooms, catering, lights out, and so on. You're going to always have those ongoing requests from people. Typical areas of supplies and services, um, everything else that helps you to run that office. And these are the people that are the experts that you can lean on, as I say, to get information, to find out more and to learn from. So coffee and tea, pens and paper and everything in between. Um, obviously, they're really important to manage from the off. So make sure you're getting the right service or supply at the best possible price at all times. Um, build a database of existing suppliers and service providers, for example, even the handyman that you might just call once a month, who pops in to change the light bulbs, your stationary supplier, your landlord, um, you know, the service provider for the building management, um, you know, and add all the contract information in there. So um, you could have your list of, of suppliers, be it ABC stationery, handyman, John, whatever it might be and then their details like their email address, phone number and so on. And then um, whether you're in a contract with them, start date, finish date, notice period, roughly what you spend with them monthly, annually, and it will start to build up a really lovely picture that helps you manage your contracts in time. So you'll know at the touch of a finger, at the click of a finger, when you can end these contracts if you need to, and what sort of notice you need to give, and also um, what your spend is. So if you had a total at the end of that spreadsheet, at the end of those columns, you'll start to see what sort of spend you're looking like monthly, annually, whatever it might be. So it's a really nice way of starting to build a bit of a budget if you don't have one. Meet your suppliers and service providers early on and introduce yourself if you haven't done it already, it's never too late and find out about the relationship they have with your firm. How did they get the job in the first place? Who do they know? Do they supply to anyone else in your building or in the area or in the same industry? And again, ask any questions at this time about the contracts or services. Um, you know, when I've started in these roles, there's so many where I meet the service providers or the suppliers and I say, oh, I haven't got a copy of our agreement or our contract. Can you send one? And they can't find one. And it just is a bit of a paperwork nightmare. So just go through that exercise and try and get everything up to date. So it's all at your fingertips. Really key. Um, and meet with them regularly, particularly if they're a critical service, if you rely on them an awful lot, um, you know, meet with them regularly, find out what's going on in the market, are there any new developments, are there any new technologies that can help you do it better, um, and infrequently if not, if they're maybe a stationary provider and you just want to meet with them once a year to go through your core list and your non-core orders and your spend and where you can save and that kind of thing, perfect, um, but do meet with them regularly at some point. Typical areas of service and supply, I'm not going to read these all out, you can see, and the reason I've put it on there, it's obvious, but the reason I've put it on there is again to demonstrate the amount of responsibility you have in these roles. It's huge. You're a florist, you're a pest control guy, you know, you're a designer, you're a furniture um, purchaser, you're responsible for health and safety. Um, you know, you're a caterer. It's, it's crazy and it's incredible. And I think you guys are superheroes. So um, if you don't ever pat yourselves on the back, now is the time to. So, yeah, to name a few. <laughs> okay, typical office setup. So we're coming to the end in a moment, but um, I wanted to just share a couple more bits about the typical kind of office setup. So generally it'll be a serviced office or a co-working space or maybe a leased office. So you're building, uh, sorry, your company may um, lease from a landlord. There might be a couple of landlords. You might have um, a landlord that you've sublet from and then a superior landlord above that. Um, or your business may even own their building or their space outright. It's quite rare, but it might be the case. Um, leased offices often have a landlord in place, which is normally an asset management firm. So if you ever look at your lease, you'll see some sort of complex name on there that's perhaps in the Middle East or somewhere where most of them are these days um, and you might see that um, yeah it's part of a, a big company that own millions if not billions of pounds worth of property um, and then they'll have assigned 
um, most of their responsibilities of running that building to a managing agent. So your CBREs, your Jones Lang LaSalle's, um, all sorts of different companies out there that do it. The landlord will collect rental payments from you either directly or via the managing agent on probably a quarterly basis in advance is the normal that we see. And the managing agent will provide your office with a management service ensuring the building is running at an operational and safe and serviced and they charge for this, um, which is known as a service charge. And again, that's invoice from the managing agent often and agreed with the landlord. There's a service charge budget as well. If you've never had access to that, ask for it. Um, it will show what's been spent in the last year, financial year, and then what they're budgeting for and what they're planning on spending it on in the coming financial year. You'll also have things like business rates and insurance. So the landlord or building management will arrange for the building to be insured, usually charged to all the tenants and it's split by lease size or square footage. And you'll need to insure your own demise, your own area and all contents in this, as well as insurances to cover public liability and employee liability. And the employee liability certificate is the one that needs to be displayed in your office. That, that post with the date on it should be displayed. Um, similar to residential council tax, businesses need to pay business rates here in the UK, um, or in short, just rates, and there's more information on that link there. Normally, you get one bill in advance of the monthly direct debits, and it's usually taken over 10 payments in the calendar year. So you, I think it's sort of uh, February, March, something like that, that you get off um, from paying them. If you ever do an office move or a fit out, or you're moving um, uh, relocating offices altogether, check and see if you can get a rates relief or if there's building work going on around your building that's noise and disruptive just um, contact a rates uh, advisor if you haven't already got one we, we know some um, that we can put you in touch with but yeah just check because often you can get what's called a rates relief and sometimes it can be thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds like 20 30 grand depending on on the size of your property and what's going on and for how long Moves, changes and work. So ensure moves are communicated as early as possible. We touched on this already. Um, provide a floor plan, which is a, like a pre and post move floor plan. So you show where people are sitting at the moment and then where they'll be sitting afterwards, particularly if it's an internal shuffle. But again, if it's a relocation, that's good. Send out a moves com email, you know, dear so-and-so, you may already be aware we're moving offices on this date. This is what we need you to do, pack this and so on and so forth. And do pre and post move check. So go to their desks just before things are decommissioned and packed up and moved and check what's there and make a note um, you know did they label their chair did they label their crate and so on um, check your lease and conditions for a fit out a lot of people um, will need to do what's called a license to alter an LTA to get permission to do a fit out and um, particularly if it starts to interfere with the um, common parts of the building and the life safety system so sprinklers emergency lighting all things that link to the building management system, the BMS, um, that's controlled by the building um, management agent, managing agent, um, they'll want to know about it and they might need um, to give you consent to do it. You often have to pay for it um, for your lawyers and their lawyers to, to do it, so it can get quite pricey, but find out if you need that before you do any work. Ask the tenant fit out guide and always tend to at least three firms um, unless you know them really, really well and it's a small job. I would say anything above 5, 10K, always just get another quote, um, at least another one, if not more. And if it's a big job, always tend to at least three companies. I have um, done quite a few recently for clients and um, yeah, people haven't tendered and it's just left them in such a muddle quite late on, to the, on into the process. So definitely tender and compare the costs it also gives you another opportunity to do that thing where we ask and it's another way of learning about what's going on and what someone's recommendation is compared to someone else's so you might get two companies in that give you completely different opinions and you decide to take an amalgamation of the two rather than going down either route you say actually i'm going to do a bit of that and a bit of that and it's really helpful for any minor works, ensure you follow the permit to work process and request RAMs, so risk assessment and method statement, public liability insurance, um, and check with the building manager for any other conditions. So any works really that involve, um, you know, someone coming into your building and doing something that's not regular, that's not just dropping off paper and delivering it, you know, even painting, you might need to get a permit to work for because people are working at height, fumes of paint and all these kind of things. So check what the process is around all that sort of stuff.
And my top tip, so create that rolling things to do project list, actively seek feedback, note it down and action later. Never make any promises ever, because <laughs> they will help you do them. Um, make your contracts and suppliers database, read through your office lease and have a look at that. A lot of it will be God for cobbledy goop and you won't be able to understand it, but try and pick out some key things like notice periods, break options, um, settling up. So how do you have to settle the building when you move out? Um, you know, all sorts of obligations like that. Health and safety status and obligations, do a sort of self-assessment if you can, or an audit to make sure you're um, tickly-boo there. Develop a floor plan and keep it up to date. Even if you're in a really small office, a floor plan is so invaluable um, to have. You can do it quite easily in something like Excel and just merge some of the cells together or make them bigger and smaller to create the desks and put people's names in them. And you know, if you've got icons and pictures you can drop in for flowers and fire extinguishers and things like that if you want to. Um, meet with your HR and line managers regularly to stay on top of those joiners and leavers and that pipeline. Um, you know, let them know you need to know. Create a moves and changes request process. I think by doing this early on, it, it helps with that you need to know um, piece. So if you say, right, for any moves going on in, in the office, not a relocation necessarily, but any moves and changes, this is the process that needs to be followed. You send me an email, da 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 da, da or whatever it might be. Um, train and mentor your team and give them additional responsibility as well. And that is hopefully a wrap. We're just under, uh, well, just in time, I think, there with my, um, my little disruption from my partner and baby. Are there any questions at all? Has that helped? Well, if there are any questions, you know where I am. Um, a lot of these tips and templates are segregated in the portal anyway, in the tips and advice section. Um, and the templates are in there. One of the ones that I'm currently creating is the MI pack. Um, so I'll drop that in there in the next week or so. But yeah, you know where I am if you have any questions or you want you know, career advice specifically in this field. So do let me know. Mm -hmm.